But at the moment, right now, we're going to start again with a panel which has some, again, amazing people on it. And it's going to be led by John Goetz, who's the South German uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and uh, NDR in Berlin. John. So, good morning. There's another procedural thing. Um, apparently, some people have the wrong password for Wi-Fi. It's BCC minus 2016. So you have to include the minus, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, this is a panel about reports from the front, and normally we think of the front being between large institutions um, and journalists trying to tell stories about those large institutions. But there's also sometimes a different front, and that's between independent investigative journalists and mainstream or large media organizations and how that front works. And I remember back in the 1980s, there was um, in New York uh, a small public radio show called, uh, from WBAI and it was called Contragate. And it was during the Iran-Contra scandal and they did every morning from 8.30 till 9, um, a half an hour on the latest developments in Contragate, you know, in the Iran-Contra affair. And if one thinks about the development since then, it, because back then they, in this contragate they read documents on, you know, on radio and they basically tried to do the kind of independent investigative work that we now know is done online uh, in a way that back then wasn't possible. Because technology's changed, there's new, I mean it's possible to create your own platform, it's possible now to do crowdfunding, it's possible to have a submission system. And all of our participants today have something to say about the relationship between large media organizations and uh, independent investigative journalism. And often it's a relationship filled with tension. Um, I know, having worked on both sides, that of course, the journalists in the main or the larger media organizations are very happy to take the stories from independent investigative journalists. But then all sorts of problems can come up. There's the question of naming, you know, who gets credited, who gets money, who gets, um, who gets basically the public authorship of the work. Um, and I think it's important because this development in the last 30 years, uh, has meant that more and more of the most interesting investigative work comes from the outside, right? It comes from journalists who don't, who have, in some ways, have more time um, and are not necessarily bound uh, in a sensual relationship <laughs> to press spokespeople. Um, and it's also interesting to note that the conflict back in 2010 between WikiLeaks, the New York Times, Der Spiegel, and The Guardian was actually about this question. It was about would these three large media organizations actually sign an agreement with an independent investigative group. Um, so Natalia Viana is our first speaker from Sao Paulo. Um, she um, has created her own independent agency for investigative work. Um, she published her first book on political assassinations in Brazil when she was 25. Since then, two books have followed. Um, she was the Brazilian partner for WikiLeaks uh, and the Diplomatic Cables. And um, she's won numerous prizes, too many to mention. And she's going to tell us about a trip she took to Angola not too long ago. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm so extremely happy to be here with people who I admire and people who I love. Um, I am the director of Agencia Pública, and Agencia Pública was founded five years ago 
when we were part, when I was partnering up with WikiLeaks, and one of the things that we do is a little bit inspired by what WikiLeaks did. We do investigative reporting, and as a non-profit investigative agency, we spread these reports because these are important stories to many different outlets in Brazil. Uh, but I'm here to tell about a particular story. Uh, uh, Something that I wanted to mention is that Agência Pública was founded and is directed by women, and most of our reporters are women. And I'm saying that not just because I'm very proud of that, coming from a very macho country like Brazil, but uh, women can connect to stories in a different way. Uh, one example, which is what I want to share with you today, is a recent investigation that we just finished published the last piece last Monday. Uh, me and filmmaker Elisa Capai went to Angola in September last year to investigate, to investigate the role of Brazilian companies in supporting the authoritarian government of José Eduardo dos Santos, who has been in power for 36 years in Angola. We arrived there one month after uh, 15 young rappers and activists had been arrested because they were holding weekly sessions of reading a book. The book taught about non-violent political action, and that's all they are doing. They were holding uh, weekly meetings and discussing the book. Now they are charged with, with trying to stage a coup against the government. They are arrested, uh, they've been arrested for six months now, and they are on an everlasting trial that's been gone for like three months. When we got to Angola, we, we, we went, to, like we, we found the story, so then we did do the investigation about the companies, but we decided we needed to connect with these families especially with the sisters, mothers, and girlfriends of these, these boys who were arrested. Uh, these women told us, they actually told us, and we, we had it on film, what it is to live under state surveillance and suffering state violence. Laurinda Gouveia is a remarkable activist. She's a, she's a student, she's 26, very young. She studies philosophy in a university there. Uh, and she told us this story that I'm going to show to you. Uh, by how she, was, um, how she was beaten up by the police when she was staging a protest in 2014. We filmed her testimony and then she take us to meet the mothers and sisters of the other activists. Please bear with me, it's four minutes long. I Davi, and they were commanders, they were police, agents of police, agents of CIS. I said, my God, here today, I don't know how, even more than alone. Exato, pegaram-me, começaram a bater-me com purete, ainda algemada, com purete, pau de vassoura, a dar-me mesmo. Para sofrer assim, vale a pena me tirar já a vida, do que não estou a aguentar a dor. E, lógico, a maneira de olhar para esses senhores não é com, como era antigamente, porque não tinha, não tinha provado dessa experiência, né? Da, de tanta maldade por a parte na, na parte deles. Com relação às mães, alguma vem aqui hoje? Hum, não sei explicar. Não sei. Sabe? Não Sim. sei, mas eu tenho o contato delas. A gente foi para a periferia de Luanda para encontrar os familiares dos presos políticos. A gente se encontrou na casa dos pais de Nito Alves. Não, o Estado, eles são civis, nunca foram militares. E ele próprio não sabia do que estava a ser acusado. Mas nós já sabemos que ele é revolucionário, e faz tempo. É, mas é, com tanto tempo fomos lhe aconselhando para poder deixar porque... O que, hum. que isso significa ser revolucionário em Luanda? Eu posso assim dizer que é a favor daquilo que são as leis, a fim de que as leis cumpram-se. Sim, estou preocupado com meu filho. Ele anda com uma raiva. O meu irmão praticamente está enlouquecido. Eu já estava reclamando uma da visão porque ele é totalmente escuro. Ele é o filho que estuda. Está a perder estudo. Tem bebê de três meses. O meu irmão. E eu tenho mais um irmão caçulho de 11 anos, ele mesmo é que cuidava de nós, porque nós somos órfãos de pai e mãe. Nesse momento não tenho como, porque os cartões deles estão todos na mão da polícia, não tenho como fazer movimento. Estou sempre a ver de dívida para poder ir lá. Cartão do banco? Sim, sim eles prenderam tudo. tudo. Telefone, no diploma, diploma, computador, tudo. 
nós temos medo, mas é, nós estamos a defender, nós até podemos ser, nós, nós temos que defender os nossos familiares, porque se não fomos nós os familiares a falar, quem vai falar? Tem sim, sim, atrás de mim, acompanhando o meu espaço. Como é que é isso? Pode descrever para gente? É, é que fica no bairro, em qualquer canto onde você estiver, ele está lá despercebido, como se fosse algum, uma pessoa qualquer, seguindo o que você está fazendo, fazer, olha, pergunta, você olha, está no sítio tal. Para ver o que é que nós, como familiares, se estamos a fazer o que é. Não sei também se eles querem nos prender, não sabemos. Mas é o de todos os dias? É, dia dia é, tinha. Hoje, por exemplo, eles sabem que nós estamos aqui, sabe? Só não podem entrar, mas eles estão mesmo ali. Na saída, assim que a gente pegou a estrada, ligaram para a gente. Oh, tirou nas fotografias. Yeah, mas eu vou... Olha, ele está ele, ele, ele atrás de nós. Apagou e ele apagou as fotografias. O motoqueiro? Está uh -huh. de vermelho. Está yeah, ali. Está lá. Está atrás de nós. Está ali. E aí, o que você quer fazer? Vamos parar. Vamos parar. Uh -huh. Para nós viver. Para ver se ele vai avançar. Vai sair, ele vai também ficar atrás de nós. Now the answer to that question is in the film. <laughs> Uh, but that was the beginning of the har harassment we felt by the Angola Angolan security forces. And the reason we were harassed is because we were talking to these women and to these girls. Um, right after this interview, Laurinda, this beautiful woman who you saw, she was charged with staging the coup as well. So she's, being, um, she's threatened of being uh, jailed for life uh, after giving us this interview. Uh, once the intelligence uh, knew we had the tape, this tape that I'm showing you, uh, they started following us. They got, dug out our visa application. They started calling people who had helped us get to Angola, saying that we were illegally in the country. Uh, two days later, a high-ranking military who works as a security chief for a major oil company approached us and let us know that our steps were being closely watched. Then, a day later, during the celebration of the president's anniversary, we were assaulted by intelligent agents who pretended to be robbers. They threw us on the floor, they stole our equipment, and in cohort with the police, who want, they wanted uh, to take us to the police station. We had to call the embassy, and the Brazilian embassy intervened. The harassment followed, followed and vamped up for the next week or so. Immigration agents and intelligent agents uh, repeatedly visited the building where we were staying, asking for information about us. And when they spread the story that we were in the country organizing protests, which is illegal in Angola, and could have us charged for espionage, we knew it was time to leave. Uh, we requested the support of the Brazilian embassy, and the Brazilian embassy led us through costumes so we could safely go back home. The reason they harassed us is because we managed to get this footage and we, we managed to listen to these kids who were just basically criticizing their government, and especially the women, uh, the mothers and the sisters. Um, they are who really know what it means to be in the front line in Angola. These women are consistently harassed by the government just because their sons and their brothers are questioning the government and staging pacific protests. And I wanted to bring you this story because we are talking about being on the front line, and of course, th these people are really on the front line. Um, this video is in English. It's, it was published by the Index of Censorship, and since we are a non-profit Creative Commons license agency, I invite any of you who have websites or blogs to republish it. Um, and this would make us very happy if you help us, because right now, these people are on trial, and they are still living this life as I speak. That's it, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Evelyn Lubbers from uh, Amsterdam. Um, her specialty has been to ferret out police and corporate spies in left-wing movements in the last uh, 25, 30 years. I've first started to work with Evelyn 
back in the mid 90s, and uh, we've kind of re-met uh, on this panel. Um, she's the author of two books, most recently, Secret Maneuvers in the Dark, Corporate and Police Spying on Activists, which I can strongly recommend. Um, and it's Evelyn's work, together with, with others, that exposed the large undercover police spying scandal in the UK. Evelyn. Um, I just need to get my presentation up. Okay, there we go. I'm Evelyn Lubbers. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, as uh, John said, I'm from Amsterdam. I've got a lot of stories to tell, but I've only got 15 minutes. So I've sort of uh, summarized my, my history here. What I'm telling you about today is the, uh, the undercover policing scandal in the UK, uh, which started with the exposure of Mark Kennedy in 2010. He was, he was living the life of an activist in uh, environmental groups. Um, he had several relationships with women. He spied upon these peaceful groups. Uh, what we know since is that there has been a unit, that, a secret unit within special branch, within the police, that spied upon political group pro protesters since 1968, since the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. Um, um, the 15 spies that have been exposed so far, most of them had long-term relationships with women. Most of the spies are men. Only one uh, uh, that we have uh, exposed until now was a woman and she didn't have relationships. I don't know what that tells us. Um, and I don't know, we haven't discovered everything, so there's more to come. Now we have an undercover, an in inquiry, an independent judge-led undercover policing inquiry. So we've come a long way. How did we get there? I think it's very crucial to know that most of the, but almost all of the research has been done by the people targeted, by the people who no longer trusted people in their direct environment. So. Uh, by the women who looked for their lost lovers because they, those people had relationships and then, you know, made plans for the future and then suddenly disappeared out of their lives completely. That's crucial. Uh, some of you may have heard the story that broke this, earlier this week uh, in the UK that Helen Steele, one of the first women who, was, uh, who found her long-lost lover and found out he was an undercover, tracked him down in Australia and found out that he was now teaching undercover policing to new generations. She confronted him on, uh, on camera. You watch the, the footage on, the, on uh, the Guardian website. It's fascinating. So it's very crucial that these people were found out by research by activists, by protest groups themselves, with the help of a few, few journalists, mainly uh, of the Guardian. So this is the, also the history of the undercover research group. Who we are? We are a small, a small network of people who were uh, involved in uh, exposing these undercovers. What we do now is we sort of map the background of these people, of the units they were in, of the sort of the network that made this spying possible all these years. Um, we, make, we try to make the results public for a large audience. I'll come back to that. And why do we do that? Because we want to hold the authorities to account. So how do we work? I'm going to focus in on one specific uh, element of our work. This is not all we do. It's very important. We don't, we don't uh, try and find spies all the time. <laughs> We're not uh, sort of a counterintelligence movement, but I can explain you how we work. Uh, before I want to continue, I want to say that it is very important that you never accuse someone without proof. I think, you know, whether we're journalists or researchers or whatever, we always have 
uh, our sources, we always have proof. And it's creating paranoia by accusing people. It's, it's doing the work of, of, of intelligence services themselves. So what we, de we did develop a method that, is, that works, works for our specific unit because we've studied their tradecraft, we've studied the way they work. So we have developed this, this 15 questions. I've, I've summarized some of them here. Uh, that you don't know that you have a spy in your midst if all these questions check out. If, if, you, can, if you can check most of the boxes, then you, you can start to do an investigation. So, uh, the absence of a family, the absence of a solid political background is very important but also very practical things, like most of them had a car at times when not many people had a car, which was very convenient because they could drive people to demonstrations, do the, the reconnaissance. If there was going to be a secret action, they would be invited to be part of the crowd to, to go see how much security there was. Um, they often have ready access to money, although they didn't have like a really regular job that sort of matched up with that amount of money. I'm going to tell you about the one specific investigation uh, and uh, an undercover officer that we exposed together with Newsnight and The Guardian early January. Um, this all started with people coming to us because we now, we have, we're sort of a specialized bureau and uh, uh, people come to us because more and more stories come out about these spying cases and people come to us for help and we, we work with these people. So the, um, the Socialist Party, which is very involved in all kinds of anti-racist activism, came to us because with all the stories that ha had come out, they had someone in mind that sort of checked all those boxes and we thought, okay, we have to investigate. So what we did then was talking to more than 20 people who had known this guy. You know, he, he was like in the midst of that movement. He had friends. He lived with people. He rented houses from people. He even had relationships. This guy had three long-time relationships with women, one of whom he proposed to. Uh, so they, they really nested into those groups. So when we talk to people, what are we looking for? We are looking for answers to those 15 questions, but the sort of the, the wider story, if, to see if he really fits the framework. And we want information to build the entire story. We also look for sort of official details see where he was registered, on which address, do we have a birthday, uh, who, what do people remember about members of his family when he talked about them. So, because that, that is a very crucial thing, because undercovers often use real details from their real life, because otherwise it gets too complicated to get all those stories in the head. Um, and the first thing we do, in fact, with those official details is find out why and how someone disappeared. There's all kinds of reasons why people would be very active for a couple of years and then move on with their life, get married, uh, get a job somewhere else. So if, you know, like, and also because this person has usually been such a close friend to many people, most of the people we talk to want it not to be true. They want to find someone and want to find out that he has not been a spy. So in this case, it was a long and windy road to find him. We even looked for, for policemen with the first name Carlo uh, to see if, if maybe he had, because this was 2000, 2005, to see if maybe he had another job now. We, in fact, we found one that sort of matched the age and the time, but it turned out he worked on sex crimes now, and one of the lawyers we worked with knew him and knew that that wasn't the guy, because we had photographs, as you can see. Um, yeah, one detail is that uh, for a long time, until 2008, or may, no, maybe a bit short, uh, mid, mid to noughties, this unit used the birth certificates of 
children who had died young to create their fake identity. So they went to the register and looked for someone their age, maybe even with a sort of similar name, and they would go to the place this baby had been born and had lived for several years to sort of feel the environment, if ever they had to talk about their youth, that they would know. So now everything is coming out, and there's even several families of the names of kids that have been used that file a claim against the police because they, fe they feel violated, as you can imagine. Um, we, so, very crucial in this research was that we could only find him in official registers for the time he was active. And he made a major slip-up, he made a major mistake because when he lived with his last girlfriend, the third one, he had registered on that address with his real name. The point was that he was about to disappear with, with so at the end of his tour of duty had come after five years, he was going to disappear, but he was going to disappear with this last woman. He was going to leave his wife as well, so apparently he needed an official address to get his meal, or he, his life was a mess and he, he messed up, and that's how we found him. So when we knew his real name, which we haven't disclosed because it's a very particular Italian name, there's only one family with that name in, uh, in the UK, we looked up that wider family and we found out that indeed when he had been talking about his, his father, he had used the name Enrico, when he talked about his mother, his sister, even his son, um, it was all the, real, the names of his real family. And it, that allowed us to, to look them up online on social, on social media and people he had lived with as an activist where he had photographs out on a shelf of his family turned out to be his real family and people who lived with him recognized the photographs online. Um, and even more important, when we found his real name, in the UK, marriage certificates and birth certificates have the occupation of someone on it. So he had his second child, or his wife, <laughs> while he was undercover in 2005, just before he left his wife, he had his second child. So we found the birth certificate which in fact says that he was a police officer. So that was our final bit of proof. Which is a, a weird moment, of course, when you get that. It's a sort of, it's very much a yes moment, but also shit, you know, it's for the family, for the friends. It's, you know, it's also not a good story. It's, you can't be too sort of glad about it. Um, the next thing is how to bring this story, how to, how to spread the word. Um, what we did, we have to, I have to hurry up, I see. Um, we did a big splash with Newsnight and The Guardian. We gave the story to them. They, did, they interviewed one of the, the women who had a relationship with him. But what happened was that the BBC had on its website a long story about this, this scoop. And it said it was a co-production from The Guardian and Newsnight, which we really liked and we couldn't get changed. Um, so what we do is we've got a blog where we explain how we found him. We've got a wiki website, a monitored wiki uh, hosted by Powerbase, uh, where we have the full story. So what we think is very important, two more two more people are being accepted by the inquiry. The public inquiry only accepts people who can prove that they've been spied upon, that they have had close involvement with the undercover officers, which is the world upside down, because they don't, want, they don't want to cooperate, they don't give out names, they stick to this policy of neither confirm nor deny whether someone has been an undercover. So it is we feel it our moral obligation to continue to bring more stories. 
And our goal is, is justice for all those people that have been spied upon. So the last part of my talk is how we fund this work. Everybody thinks it's important work, it should be done, but how do we get it funded? Um, that has to do with our role and our position, the issue that has been discussed here before. We do all kind of work that investigative reporters are supposed to do. Uh, I've summed something up, I'm, I'm not gonna, we press for transparency. Uh, I think without us, not specifically our group, but all the, all the people that were involved in exposing the undercovers, there wouldn't even have been any public inquiry. There were a dozen internal police reviews that all stayed secret, confidential, and we kept pressing and we kept pressing. I think the difference between us and investigative reporters is um, we, we if I, like I said, it's not us that made the push for the inquiry. It's also the people we work with. We don't work alone. And our position, our own activist background, I, I've been working in this for like 30 years, makes that people, the people involved, trust us and come to us with their stories. And our work does support the campaign uh, to end this political policing. So who's going to pay for this work? What we did is, uh, and this allows me to sort of give you a peek into another project, what we tried to do is hyphen off separate projects that were easier to fund, that were easier to sort of, to, to, to frame. The special branch fast project is one of them. What we do is um, we sort of, we asked journalists who have, um, who have managed to really to, to get special branch files released through the Freedom of Information Act to share them with us. Because over the years, many journalists have got these files, they've written one or two articles on them, and they, they lay, you know, all the, and all the paperwork is just gathering Dutch dust on their attics or on their desks. So what we do, is we've, we've scanned them all. We've got several collections and there's more to come. We use a document cloud to put up those files, which allows for these very beautiful windows into the documents. And if you click on them, if you look, if you look at the, I think the top one, here is the entire document and you can then leave through the document. It's a very simple project. It's document cloud and, and a blog website, but I, I really love it. I would love to do more of that. So, who's, who's to, to fund our work? I think, sort of the, as is obvious here, this, this, this diver, the, the divide between mainstream media, investigative journalism, and organizations like us is something that we have to accept. And that sort of we need a new model where, where investigative reporters, dedicated activists, NGOs work together and we need a new model to fund that. In the meantime, we also need the, a bridge to gap that because the moment is not there yet. So my, my big example, and it's, I'm, I'm almost finished now, uh, is the National Security Archive. Don't mix up the acronym. This, is, this has been... <laughs> I, I think there must have been a joke in that <laughs> at the time they set this up. This was set up 30 years ago, so they do similar work like we do, but on a, ver on a larger scale, collecting documents related to security. They do research, they're connected with universities. I, ve I'm, I think that is a model that needs to be studied. In the meanwhile, you can follow us on Twitter. Um, We've got, we set up a donation page. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as the, um, the advert time. My book is for sale at the CIG uh, stand at uh, stall 23. And I'm here this, um, tonight at dinner. There's a session, a sort of breakout session. If people want to know more about my work, I will be there at 7, so halfway to dinner. Okay, that's my story. Thank you. Um, Nafiz Ahmed um, yeah. has come up with his own solution to 
um, the conflict uh, and the tension between mainstream media and independent investigations, he created his own platform. Um, and uh, he's the founding editor of the crowd-funded investigative journalism project Insurge Intelligence, which he created one day after getting a phone call from his editor at The Guardian telling him that his blog was canceled after he wrote a story about gas reserves off the coast of Gaza. He's the author of a sci science fiction novel called Zero Point and a nonfiction book called A User's Guide to the Crisis of Civilization. Uh, Nafiz Ahmed. How do I get the uh, thing on, up on the screen? Thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about, I guess you're gonna, I'm going to talk about my, my journey as a journalist. I've been um, pretty much a freelance journalist for about 15 years. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I got what I thought was my kind of big break moment when I, I got a small gig at The Guardian. Um, before I, I did that, I'd come from an academic background in international security. Um, but I got fed up with academia. I felt it was too ivory tower and there wasn't enough um, advocacy and communication with the wider public. So that's why I got more and more engaged in journalism. Um, and uh, I'd experimented with a lot of different things. I'd made a film called The Crisis of Civilization, which we released for free and you can watch it on YouTube and it went viral. And it was all about how lots of different crises that are often assumed to be um, separate from each other, are actually fundamentally interconnected. So, you know, like the environment crisis, energy, the economy, terrorism, war, blah, blah, blah. So we made a film about that. And that was kind of what springboarded. And I, I, I was doing some reporting and stuff, and eventually I um, managed to get this gig at The Guardian, writing my own environment blog, um, where I would basically talk about um, the geopolitics of energy, economic and environmental crises and how they all fit together. So I was there, I was there for about a year. Um, and it was, it, was, it was cool because under my contract, I could publish straight to the website. Um, I didn't have um, a stringent editorial review process. Um, and uh, you know we did have a lot of good contact with the editors and we worked really closely with them. Um, we'd bounce around ideas. We had a little spreadsheet which we all shared, which we would post up our, uh, the projects that we were working on. So it was a good, cool, very collaborative and exciting endeavor. And I was really excited about the whole thing. Um, so I was writing a lot about things like ISIS and the role of energy in the rise of ISIS, um, the Syrian conflict and, and the role of the drought in the Syrian conflict and, and food crisis and how the food crisis led to, played a big role in, in catalyzing the Arab Spring. So looking at stuff that, was, that we see in the, in the headlines and trying to kind of dig a little bit deeper to look at the systemic thing. So as part of this trajectory, um, Operation Protective Edge had taken place in, uh, by Israel in, the, in the occupied territories. I wrote this piece which pretty much followed up stuff that I'd been writing before um, a, a couple of years earlier, I'd written a piece for Le Monde Diplomatique on the role of Gaza's offshore gas resources in Operation Cast Lead. Um, and I'd quoted um, a couple of official statements, that, uh, a couple of, uh, uh, there was a publication that had been put out um, by uh, a think tank in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, the author of it was the incumbent defense secretary, Moshe Alon. Um, who spoke really openly about the, um, the Gaza's offshore gas resources, the need for military, uh, military intervention as a mechanism to displace Hamas, because uh, Hamas being the fundamental obstacle to Israel being able to drill. So basically, I did this piece which updated it and looked at the evolution of, of this whole issue and its origins and all the rest of it. Um, and eventually, the piece went viral. Uh, it got something like 80,000 shares on Facebook. Um, and um, literally the next day after posting it, and the thing is, is that 
I had put this into the spreadsheet. So it was not like my editors didn't actually know this was coming. Um, but I, so, so the next day I got a call from, from my, one of my senior editors, um, and he just said to me, literally, Nafiz, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to cancel your blog. And I, I was just a bit like, literally, what the fuck? Like, what? You, what? what? Um, and, and he just said, Nafiz, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cancel your blog. Um, this is not an environment story. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, and he said, this is not an environment story. This belongs on SIF. You know, the comment is free. It doesn't belong in our section. Um, and we're going to have to just terminate the blog. So literally, unilaterally, that very day, um, the blog was terminated. I got a, a letter from the rights manager in the email um, formally terminating my contract. Um, and obviously, as a, as, a, as, a, as a journalist, like this was a few years ago, as a, as, a, as a freelance journalist who was kind of like just kind of breaking into the mainstream, this was like a complete shock to me. And I had no idea what to do. Um, I, I, di I didn't know who to go to for advice. I, I, um, I didn't have many... I mean, I spoke to some colleagues and they were just like, yeah, you know, sometimes this happens, blah, blah, blah. So I had no idea what to do. And then so my immediate reaction was, how do I get back into The Guardian? <laughs> how do I get back? Um, so, so, so I kind of stayed quiet for a while. And, and, uh, and they said to me, don't worry, Nafiz, it's fine. You know, you can keep pitching to us. So I did. I kept pitching. Um, and I kept pitching the same kind of stuff I was doing. But, it, you know, I, I, I could see that there was a brick wall. So eventually, after a while, I kind of um, attained some kind of enlightenment. And I realized that, you know, fuck it. If people need to know about this. This is insane. Um, so I, I, um, I, I'd been thinking about my future and all the rest of it. So anyway, I, I had basically, I, I wrote a piece which you can read online where I just broke the whole story wide open. Um, and it basically, um, it, uh, that piece also went viral and it elicited a, a formal statement from The Guardian where they just said, and you can find this as well and I've, I've got all the links uh, if you just Google it. And, it. and they just said, it was like, two paragraphs, and they said something like, Nafiz Ahmed um, was not employed by The Guardian. He was a freelance, uh, he had a freelance contract, blah, 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 blah. And then they said, and the article he had written was not an environment story. So they basically just said the same thing. Um, but, I mean, the problem was, was that the, the excuse didn't make any sense, given that they had commissioned me to write stories like this. So that was my kind of direct experience of... Um, of really, I felt, was a form of censorship, effectively, at, at a newspaper which is still, you know, one of, the, one of the better mainstream newspapers, which still does a lot of good investigative work. I still have a lot of respect uh, for my colleagues at The Guardian, and I do have respect for the paper. Um, but this really raises deeper questions about the institutions that we have. It's not, it's not just about The Guardian, it's not just about the editors, it's not just about the institutional culture of The Guardian, it's about the media and the way the media works. Um, so, I mean, I, um, and I'm sure that this kind of experience is not a unique experience, especially for freelance journalists who have to deal with editors at different publications, and, you know, you have to deal with egos, and you have to deal with strange deadlines, and you have to deal with you know, people changing their minds, and all kinds of strange things. Um, but the, the, the things that I noticed from this experience were, were one, that, that I taught editorial constraint, obviously, that this very top-down editorial system. Also, this subject over specialization. What is an environment story and what is a non-environment story? Um, you know, how do you define these parameters? And the thing is, is that I had, they had commissioned this blog precisely for me to break those boundaries. That was the whole thesis that I was advocating as a journalist. Um, but then they defaulted back to this position very conveniently. We don't want to talk about Gaza's gas. We don't consider that to be an environment story. Somehow Palestine exists outside of the planetary environment. Um, but this was, this was basically something that I began to see was th there were patterns here. Um, and one of the other patterns that I want to mention very briefly before I go on um, was uh, the Guardian's reporting on, on HSBC. And there was be, there's been a lot of hullabaloo about how there's been a number of uh, publications would have broken the Swiss leaks HSBC story, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, but there was another story um, in the UK uh, which didn't make headlines, 
Um, uh, and, and it came from a whistleblower whose name was Nicholas Wilson, who basically had uncovered, while he was working for a firm of solicitors, he had uncovered um, a, a £1 billion fraud that had been committed by a subsidiary of HSBC using uh, the, uh, the credit cards that you get from stores like, like retail stores like John Lewis and others. And what they were doing, they were doing these incremental overcharging of consumers um, and it was just adding up. And this process had taken place for more than a decade and the scale had, had been estimated at about over a billion pounds. A huge award, bigger than the Swiss League scandal. Now, Nicholas Wilson, his case is currently still under investigation by the Financial Conduct Authority. I mean, there was a big cover-up. Um, there were the official agencies attempted to put it under the carpet and eventually, um, after, after kind of pushing forward, he's got another inquiry taking place. Um, but the Guardian refused to cover this. In fact, it wasn't just the Guardian, the Sunday Times, BBC. When I started to look into this, I ended up looking, looking into the different uh, media organisations in the UK that had actually investigated the story. Nicholas Wilson had spoken to dozens of mainstream media agencies who had actually conducted some quite detailed investigations. In fact, one of them, Private Eye, who's a well-known uh, magazine that kind of do this kind of muckraking thing sometimes, but they're kind of comedic. They had had, I'd, I'd seen a whole draft. They'd got a whole draft, but they just spiked it. And I asked them, um, why did you spike this story? And they just said, we don't want to comment on this. Um, so, and like two days after I, after I did my story on Wilson's um, revelations, Private Eye suddenly published a kind of more watered down uh, thing on their story. So there was, so, so there was definitely this, this problem. And one of the things I saw at Guardian was that the Guardian has all of these interesting links with HSBC. So one of the things you're probably not aware of is that um, HSB is one of the biggest advertising sponsors of the Guardian. They've given more uh, sponsorship to the Guardian than they've given to uh, the Telegraph, where there was a similar scandal that you might have heard of, where Peter Oborn, the chief political commentator, came out and said that HSBC, because of their sponsorship and advertising agreements with the Telegraph, the Telegraph has not run any stories on HSBC corruption. Um, but the Guardian has got more money from HSBC, to, uh, which has gone to growing its presence in the United States. And that's just one element of it. There are people who sit on the board of the Scott Trust Limited, which is not a trust, even though it's called the Scott Trust, but it's Scott Trust Limited. It's a private company. Um, and those people are people who have got links to the financial sector, um, people who have worked with HSBC, who have received sponsorship from HSBC, and so on and so forth. So is this, there is this big wider issue um, that the, the, the experience I had at The Guardian that I think uh, opens up this whole question that we've heard being discussed here of, corp, of the corporate ownership and corporate structures and the whole, the whole way in which the media runs. So... My, my, the way I've dealt with this, and I'm going to have to uh, run through this really quickly, is I was trying to, um, I mean, I've, I had always come from this, from this uh, background of trying to catalyze um, um, technologies and, and kind of like um, community, community kind of activism in a way that make, to kind of, to kind of get things to get bigger. So, and, you know, and that kind of worked with, for me, when it worked when I made the film, Crisis of Civilization, we didn't have an official distributor, we hardly had any money to make it, but the film went viral because we literally just went up and down the country doing screenings, and we went to a couple of other places around the world as well. And, and, and it was just literally word of mouth that eventually got, got the word out about the film. Um, so this was what kind of made me think about crowdfunding and other stuff. And I'd seen some other really interesting examples. Like there's an, uh, in the Netherlands, there's, this, uh, there's De, Cor De Correspondent, where they did a crowdfunding thing and they raised something like over a million euros or something. Um, and they're completely independent and there's no advertising. So this was really inspired me and I thought, I want to try and set something like this up in the English language. Um, so what I did, and we're very much in transition phase right now, um, I used patreon.com. Um, to, to set up a subscription crowdfunding thing. Now, Patreon.com is a website which primarily caters to um, artists who create stuff and they have a following. Um, so I used Patreon.com to put out a call to say, people out there who are interested in supporting my work, they can donate however much they like 
um, ha um, every month, um, as little as a dollar, as much as 10, 20, or however much they like. Um, and if they want, they can, they can donate once, just once. They can cancel the donation, so it's a one-off donation. Um, and then what I started doing was using that to fund my investigations. Um, and I was publishing these investigations on medium.com, um, which you know, was helping it to get out there and giving it a bit of an audience, obviously distributing through the normal social media channels. Um, and it ended up becoming a bit of an accidental model because I, in order to also keep myself uh, afloat, I uh, attached myself to two mainstream publications, Vice and Middle East Eye. So I was writing columns for them. Um, and I ended up an, uh, getting about, so we have like a community around the world of about 500 people um, all together uh, who are really solid and it kind of fluctuates from there. Um, and we get about $2,000 a month um, from the crowdfunding and I supplement that with men come from other kind of freelance commissions and stuff in the columns. Um, and, 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 and the model I think is, is this, is that the crowdfunding is powerful because it means that you don't have to worry about other people pulling your strings. The only people that pull your strings are people. And, and, it's, and it's really cool because it gives you new opportunities to engage with your audience, engage with people who really love what you're doing, and to make the whole process of journalism more interactive. And it's a learning experience as well. And it's been like that for me. The other thing is that I think people want to see competence. It's not just that they want to say, oh, yeah, yeah, crowdfunding. They actually want to know that you're going to produce good investigations that have integrity, that are done professionally. Um, so there is, there is a value to being someone who has worked your way through that maelstrom of professional corporate insanity that, that is the journalistic world, in the sense that at least you've kind of cut your teeth and you know what you're doing. And the other thing is that when you're breaking stories, what, what I've seen is that, you know, we've put out stories that haven't got that much pickup, and we've put up sto stories which, you know, they've just go, they just go crazy, they go mad. And it's not because we've got, we don't have a budget for advertising or anything like that. People like good stories that educate them on stuff that they don't know about. I'm going <laughs> to close off <laughs> in 30 seconds. Um, so I want to give you just, I'm going to close here just to give you, I'll just keep the screen up quickly. Um, so, we, so these are t uh, three examples of, of stories that we put out um, that went, did really well. Um, so the first story, how the CIA made Google, how Google made the, how made the NSA. Now this is interesting because this is, this is like the longest two-part investigation I've ever written in my life. It's virtually a book. It's, I think it's about 40,000 words long altogether. So people, but, but it's, so it's a true, truly long read investigation. It is the most widely read story I've ever, ever written, um, I think. Together, it's been read by about um, nearly a half a million people around the world. Um, and um, it basically, I, we, I broke the story with an on-the-record source, um, Professor to, uh, um, Bhavani Theresingham, who is a cybersecurity expert at the University of Texas, basically managed, um, um, uh, managed for the, defense, uh, the private defense firm um, a, a, a program which basically was funding innovative technologies. And one of the things they funded at Stanford was um, the Google project um, at inception. So we've got the other examples there. You know, at the Pentagon report, there was a declassified document which we, which we blasted out. And um, just by writing these stories, we were fortunate that we managed to get um, a lot of pickup, as you can see, as, as examples. So it's an interesting model. It's still in transition, and, and, I, uh, and I think the experiment that we're, see, we're doing now is to see how far we can grow it and how far I can extract myself away from dependence on, on, on the mainstream and move more into, into the realm of, of people-powered journalism. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, we're going to have a Q&A at the, at the end, if we can all stick with, <laughs> within our 15-minute blocks. Uh, next is uh, uh, Martin Vez, uh, who's the editor of Noseweek, uh, uh, a monthly publication out of Cape Town. Um, he has a long history, actually, in, in the largest newspapers of South Africa. Um, and when he was fired... Uh, from the second largest newspaper of South Africa, an Afrikaans newspaper. Um, he was given six months' pay 
and he was allowed to keep his car. And he used that to start Nose Week, um, which has as its motto, news you're not supposed to know. Martin. Before I started Nose Week magazine, a colleague and I ran a sort of summed up publication over weekends out of my garage called simply Nose. This was to distinguish it from the eye in London being private eye. Um, and in one of its early editions, um, thanks to an anonymous source in the South African Revenue Service, we discovered that the then thoroughly terrifying Minister of Law and Order, uh, who commanded police units that were out to murder in various ways opponents of the apartheid government of the time. On the side, he was running a tax fiddle. And so we rather gleefully published this in our Nose magazine, uh, which not too long thereafter, um, I was tipped off to expect a visit from the South African police. Five o'clock one morning, duly, there was a knock on the door and there were three police officers, one of whom very formally, me standing there in my dressing gown, asked me, was I Martin Veltz? And I said, yes. And he muttered, I wouldn't have admitted that if I were you. <laughs> well, uh, that leads me to something I wanted to say before I launch into my story of misery and grief. And that is, I really want to dedicate my contribution here to all the good people, the good people who actually make possible what we all do, the people who tell us, who give us the information, who turn out to be much nicer people than maybe we had suspected. Um, the whistleblowers who frequently face dire consequences after speaking to us. Anyway, um, I want to talk a bit about, because I thought the whole idea of secrecy was a very important element of this conference, um, the only book I've ever written was on a South African poet called Brayton Breitenbach, uh, a left-wing sympathizer, but an excellent poet, unfortunately in Afrikaans, not English, so not that big an audience. Uh, he, for his collaboration with uh, the African National Congress in the revolutionary days, uh, was caught smuggling passports, false passports for activists, and was jailed for many years. And in the course of being jailed, he was jailed in a cell on death row in Pretoria Central Prison, not because he faced the death sentence, but I think it was a sort of subtle punishment because he had to witness the grief of those in neighboring cells um, and the anxieties of those who really did face the death sentence pretty well on a weekly basis for all the years he was there. Even more sinisterly, the South African um, secret police decided they needed to know who all his friends were who he had not exposed. And so they planted a warder on him who would visit him at 2 and 3 a.m. in the morning to start some conversation with a man who in solitary con con confinement was denied conversation. And you must imagine this, he's a poet, he's a words person, he communicates. So here's this rather naive prison warder making small talk with him, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, getting him talking, getting him talking about himself and so on, and of course, planted on the water is a bug. These conversations are being recorded. And increasingly, the water is prompted to ask leading questions and to be a collaborator and to want to help and to want to carry messages for him to outside. No doubt, they were more interested in where the messages were destined and so on. This led to a second trial, 
He was charged with trying to convert the water to communism, I have to tell you. Uh, <laughs> in any case, my book was based on pretty well a year's tape recordings of those deep night conversations with a really gifted poet and imaginative person, um, which in a funny way puts another sort of spin on spying, on the co secret collection of information, which of course quite often delivers the most authentic information. That said, I want to put on the table first, I want to acknowledge the obvious philosophical dilemma. Why do we want the privilege of secrecy and privacy for ourselves while demanding the right to hack others? There are many aspects and issues that arise from that question, but for my purposes I need to ref refer only to two. The only way we can justify such an otherwise absurd sounding proposition is if we are dealing with a serious imbalance in power, the powerful versus the powerless. How did the situation rise? How did the powerful gain their power and how did the powerless become so? With an elementary knowledge of human nature, we know that the powerful are easily tempted to abuse that power. As an investigative journalist, we attempt to restore balance by exposing abuses of power and restore justice to the exploited powerless. A final absurdity, why do we wish to keep secret what we intend to publish anyway? None of these issues are new or peculiar to the digital age. Only the scale of it is new. In my career, I have stolen keys over a weekend to gain over the weekend access to government offices and a strong room containing secret research papers that showed that the apartheid government of South Africa was informed by its own research materials that it could never succeed with its plan of racial segregation. This is 15 years. <clears throat> this was 15 years before that government collapsed. I have surreptitiously removed papers from an unsuspecting official's desk that minuted a secret meeting. Hiding the identity of vulnerable sources is possibly the most important justification for secrecy. Encryption will not necessarily achieve that. On the contrary, it might otherwise, it might otherwise draw attention to what could have passed unnoticed. On the question of encryption, do we really honestly believe that Apple has succeeded in keeping the secrets of its iPhone encryption from the National Security Agency the FBI and the CIA. Quite apart from the political probabilities, as an old-fashioned investigative journalist, ask yourself, how many employees at Apple have to know the secret to have made it an element of one of their biggest products? 10, 15, 50? If so, you and I know it's long no longer a secret. So who is fooling who and why? I leave that for you to ponder. <clears throat> back in the old tricks, back to the old tricks of retyping acquired secret documents to remove peculiarities of type and paper. Burying your document trove in a plastic bag in the compost heap in a neighbor's garden. That's what I did the night before the police arrived at my front door. It was extremely successful. I found that most effective when forward, oh yes, I've told you that. We live in an age when corporate power frequently exceeds state power and ends up being the power behind the power. This is peculiarly the case in a kleptocracy such as South Africa and I believe Russia has become. I'd happily add Angola to that list after hearing an earlier speech today. That secret shift of power requires a lot of spying between the contenders and their potential critics. And the media is very easily, I regret to say, seduced into becoming a player on the wrong side. The Johannesburg Sunday Times, South Africa's biggest circulation newspaper, 
has a celebrated investigative team that has been seduced and manipulated by various criminal factions of the country's National Intelligence Service. All of them corrupt or corrupted, one way and another, by corporations, into assisting in the destruction of vital elements of state institutions. A police unit whose, whose special task was to investigate violent and serious crimes. The National Prosecution Service and the South African Revenue Service. The Sunday Times has played an absolutely critical role in the destruction of all three of those institutions over the past three years. In the process it has, in its creation of illusion, maybe delusion, has actually won international journalism prizes for that enterprise. The Sunday Times was seduced with juicy leaks into being the front runner in first discrediting those institutions with false accusations, I add, discredited them in the public eye with a headline front page lead story. Um, the police unit was headed with a headline the police hit squad, and it showed a truckload of bodies had, that had been shot uh, by the police. Unfortunately for them, the picture, this horrendous picture on the front cover, uh, were victims, if you like, of a shootout between a, a cash-in transit robbery gang in the province of KwaZulu-Natal that had itself shot in the process of various encounters, half a dozen policemen, shot and killed half a dozen policemen, and as many witnesses that would have testified to them, two of them literally on the steps of the High Court where they were about to testify. Uh, so I, I'm trying to give you a picture, but now the, the, this, the oddity of this is that those policemen who shot the, the, pic, the bodies pictured in the picture were none of them members of this particular unit that was branded as the hit squad. This is but a minor element of a much larger investigation which Noseweek and various collaborating journalists set about over a two-year period. It transpired that the Sunday Times had re received its main leak from a prominent criminal in the province who had bribed and corrupted various policemen himself, who was a close, close friend and associate of the president's family, and a further the head of the Police Crime Intelligence Unit, an officer called Mbluli, who is one of the most corrupt individuals in South Africa, has used the secret police slush fund as a slush fund to find, fund family, friends, and members of the cabinet. Noseweek, so we've focused on the past three years on unraveling that grotesque situation. And you can find details of that on our website, which is very simple, www.noseweek.co.za. Uh, in the search field, all you need to type in is Mdluli, M-D-L-U-L-I, or Cato Manor, C-A-T-O, separate word Manor, M-A-N-O-R. That was the name of the police unit. And similarly, a similar process followed with regard to the South African Revenue Service. Now, it has emerged in South Africa now, in the last two or three weeks, that control of the South African Revenue Service is seen as control of a cash flow for the governing party or factions within the governing party. And the question one asks oneself is, how come the South African Revenue Service, which is collecting taxes to fund state institutions or states' work, how come it is perceived to be a cash cow for politicians? And I suggest if one use one's in just a bit of intelligence to think about it, it has to involve a fair amount of blackmail on tax evaders. Instead of paying the fine and the prison, uh, running the risk of imprisonment for tax evasion, tax fraud, a small contribution would be helpful to both you and I. I'm 
I'm going to leave it at there. I'm going to give, give other speakers a bit more time, maybe, because I'd really like to participate in a discussion <laughs> on all sorts of things here. Because in South Africa, I, as I say, we are facing an increasingly dysfunctional state. And that affects not only me as an ordinary citizen, but it directly affects me as a public publisher of an alternative publication. My publication depends on a form of crowdfunding, if you like, and what that is, is subscriptions. People want to read, I have discovered, the truth, and particularly if you are consistent in your commitment to the truth. Uh, you are not afraid of telling the truth. It's, it's absolutely remarkable how in my experience, a wide audience actually appreciates that. You have immense support from decent, ordinary people who perceive you doing that. So, people buy subscriptions to our publication. The unfortunate thing is we need to deliver it. And the increasing problem in South Africa is we have a non-functional post office. So, if we undertake to give you 12 subscriptions in a year, the chances are only 10 will be delivered, and of those 10, another three will arrive three to six weeks late, which is not pleasing to somebody who subscribed to a news magazine. So uh, that has seriously affected us as a publication. We've had to try and find alternative means of publishing. The, I want to share something interesting with you, and that is we have gone, in addition to printing a magazine, we have gone digital, and you can read us on Facebook, and um, uh, sorry, on, on, uh, through iTunes or Kindle, but we've actually had a surprising number of people who went digital and then have reverted to print for the pleasure, if you like, of read, leading, reading longer journalism on paper, a curiosity which I share with you. Thank you. <clears throat> so before we go to the discussion, I'd like to introduce, uh, before um, we have one last speaker, um, Jake Applebaum is surprisingly enough perhaps to some people, is now working on a PhD in math at a university in the Netherlands, in Eindhoven. Um, Jacob Applebaum was one of, was perhaps the first employee of the Tor project. He was an early member of WikiLeaks. Um, and in terms of journalism, he, it's very interesting when we think about what was the big story in Germany of 2013, we tend to think right away, oh, it was the Edward Snowden re revelations. But the real huge story in Germany and that kind of riveted the world was the story that appeared in Der Spiegel and it was about the mobile phone of Angela Merkel being listened to by the NSA. That actually was not a story that came from Edward Snowden. It's a story that came from Jake Applebaum. Um, um, hi. So, um, First of all, it's really an honor to be here. It's really uh, fantastic to see so many colleagues in the audience that I've worked with as well. And uh, to some of you, I'm sorry for some of the things that I, I, I'll say next, but not, not so sorry that I won't say them. Um, so um, as a technologist in particular, I um, find myself often in a tech ghetto. And so I kind of expect that everyone here will expect me to talk about technology, but instead I want to talk about, well, I want to talk about the biggest threat to investigative journalists. And that is other investigative journalists. And uh, if that sounds a little bit ridiculous, I'd like to tell you a story. And the story is pretty simple. Most of my story are personal anecdotes that I've experienced in the last three to 10 years working as a journalist independently, publishing on the internet, but also publishing with Der Spiegel, uh, working with ProPublica or other agencies in different capacities. And so I come from a background of working with WikiLeaks to these organizations. And uh, currently, WikiLeaks is in, I don't know, the sixth or seventh year of being investigated by the US government for espionage and terrorism. So there's an important context there, which is when we talk about journalism, there is a big tent. 
And that big tent, when you're inside of it, you have the political support, or if you will, the privilege. Uh, most of the white male journalists in the room will, of course, know what I'm talking about when I speak of privilege, and this is a part of that privilege. And so what I would say, in particular, is that I'd like to address a few, a few realities about that. So one of them is literacy, which is to say most of the people that are in this room, which I would say I've worked with, they understand to some extent technology. Uh, but you've heard it here a little bit already, um, where people sort of talk about the tech guys and they bring up the tech guys. And there's an interesting thing there, which is actually there, there's a, an issue of literacy. We don't, we don't need to talk about tech activism just the same we don't need to talk about, for example, grammar activism or fact check activism. Um, this is a fundamental core component of modern journalism, being able to use a computer, understanding operational security. And what happens is that when people don't understand that, instead of having a little bit of humility, of which I have plenty, I'm sure you can see, um, they will absolutely do everything that they possibly can in order to discredit and to disqualify other journalists. And you actually see this happening all the time. That is to say, if you know how to use a computer, you're instantly a nerd, and the nerd is instantly out. And this is done under the mask of so-called objectivity. And to that I say, you are rarely, if ever, fucking objective. Your politics are in everything that you write. And so the question is, where are the disclosures and where is the data? So when I, when I speak of literacy here, I don't only mean, of course, about fact checking or about understanding how systems work, but also literacy and understanding what is and is not political. So for example, when we consider that capitalism itself pits us against each other, are we questioning that? Do we consider that the competitive models in journalism actually cause us to push people outside of the tents? Isn't it the case that when we negotiate about our contracts, isn't it the case when we think about money, that that in fact is at the core causing us to betray each other and in fact to betray the public? I think the answer to that is yes. And I think the answer to that for me personally means that I have almost every single time I've worked on stories, I've taken, I would say, very small amounts of money. I've tried not to make my primary living from working as an independent journalist because in fact I find that it compromises me. It means that I'm tied to one editorial room, I'm tied to one political viewpoint, and usually those viewpoints are hidden away. They're hidden away where it's uh, supposedly objective. But I tell you what, The Guardian, absolutely the shittiest publication in the English language, is shitty not for what they publish, but shitty for what they refuse to publish and pretend that it is a non-political discussion and decision. And so I want to tell you a little bit about why they're shitty and give you some sourcing, which you can then, if you'd like, investigate. Um, I've not talked about most of these things in public, but I think it's important that after all of these great journalists have uh, built up a tree of journalism that we can put some fuel on the tree and then light the motherfucker on fire. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> so first I think we should, I, I, I guess I should, I should start by saying it's not just The Guardian. I've experienced this a lot. Um, some of you have written things in papers, for example, where you call me or Julian Assange or Sarah Harrison, internet activists. Um, to you that have done that, I think that you do not understand potentially what you do, and in that case, I, I have some forgiveness for you. But for those of you that do, I understand that you think me your political enemy, and uh, I, uh, I take that up quite seriously, and I will win. So, with that in mind, I don't call you a grammar activist, but I would say that it is important that if we have disclosure activists in the audience. I think it's important to consider, for example, that when we have bylines together in papers, and later you call me an internet activist, it's important to remember that you should probably have disclosed in your article where you called me an internet activist that actually we were co-authors on, for example, uh, the equivalent of the German Pulitzer Prize or something similar to that. To call me an internet activist is to consciously put me outside of the political tent of privilege and to say, go ahead. Instead of being under journalism law, you're under terrorism law. And of course, it's, it's of course important to name names, and so thank you to the sponsor, uh, Der Spiegel, uh, kein Angst vor der Wahrheit. Um, I think it's important to say, Michael Zonheimer, that for me, when you call me an internet activist, it breaks my heart because we have worked together. But more importantly, it breaks my heart because you put me under threat of going to prison for the rest of my fucking life. <laughs> Mm. 
one of my favorite journalists in Germany, his name is Tilo Young. He's a, he's a wonderful journalist. He has a very funny comedy show. And uh, he says, alle Journalisten sind Aktivisten für die Wahrheit. All journalists are activists for the truth. And so let us address this concept of activism. And it works like this. Activism is used as a pejorative term in order to suggest that participation in a democratic society is somehow outside of the normal behavior. Fuck that. That is wrong. <laughs> the purpose of journalism, the purpose of journalism is not only to be engaged, but to engage others in that process. That is the purpose. It is to spread the truth. It is to bring facts. It is to put forward information. So let us speak of the crimes now of The Guardian, who are by far much worse than anyone else in this realm, in my experience. First, what we will start with is David Lee and Alan Rusbridger. Why will we start with them? Well, first with David Lee, because he is an incompetent, illiterate, absolutely despicable human being with how he has treated Julian Assange. He has lied about facts about Julian Assange, suggesting, for example, that Julian suggested that informants deserved it when, in fact, no such thing was said, as John being at that lunch can attest to that. He has, for example, released encrypted files, not understanding the difference between encryption and authentication and done so in a way that actually published information that previously had even been withheld by WikiLeaks, and then blaming WikiLeaks for that. This is a, an absolutely atrocious problem, but what is worse than that is that when confronted with it, he continued to take his ignorance with him all the way out the door at The Guardian instead of correcting his mistake and owning his mistake. And for that, I really hope that we never forget that. We should never forget David Lee's legacy is to have published things and to have done so because he did not even understand what they were doing and then to put Julian Assange under a bus so that that bus could run him over instead. So let us call that what it is. It is a political act of betrayal of Julian Assange. In the early days of the Snowden affair, I worked with Glenn Greenwald and with Laura Poitras and with many others, many in this room. Two of the, the great journalists that I worked with, Marcel Rosenbach and Holger Schark, have really honored me. They helped me to have a visa in Germany to be safe here, and I really respect that very much. And they understood what it meant to work with me. And in the past, having worked with WikiLeaks, they were extremely good about this. They were in constant communication. They absolutely told us what they understood, they knew, they treated us as equals, they were so respectful to us that it is in some ways beyond the pale. And an important, and, wait a second, and I wanna thank them for that, because that is, with the exception of John Getz and a very few other people, they are the exception of doing that. They treated us as equals. They did not try to treat us as sources or to manipulate us. They actually cared very much about getting out the truth. They understood the political impacts. They understood the big tent. They understood the umbrella. And for that, I really think that they deserve a round of applause. So thank you, Marcel and Holger. I know that you're here. Now let's contrast that, for example, with The Guardian. The Guardian, I requested a letter from The Guardian to say, that I was working on classified documents. Now, Glenn Greenwald had passed me a number of documents while working with him, uh, specifically technical related documents, which he wanted me to help to sort of elucidate what they did and what kind of crimes the NSA was committing. And The Guardian actually refused, directly refused to give me a letter knowing that I was in possession of classified documents. They directly refused to put myself and other people under that political tent. They simply didn't want to do it. And so since I'm not under contractual obligation and have no loyalty to people that want to put me outside of the tent, I'd like to tell you a funny story about them. <laughs> and it goes like this. When The Guardian was raided, they did not call myself or Laura Poitras here in Germany to tell us that the GCHQ and other political powers and police powers in the UK had in fact come to destroy source material. They did not tell us. We had to find out in public. They left us to hang in public. They did not treat us as equals. They did not protect us. They did not care. And they continued with this every step of the way. And while writing technical stories, they directly consulted with the White House and with GCHQ and other government officials in order to do essentially line by line redaction of things that were for the most part not actually even worth redacting. They weren't even worth compromising yourself. It reminds me of the Winston Churchill story about whether or not someone would 
sleep with him for a million dollars. And of course, when the person says no to one dollar, but yes to a million, we know what kind of person that person is. And the same is true for The Guardian. They were willing to compromise and to give editorial control to the state. What are they then? They are stenographers. And the way, for example, they talk about Laura Poitras, who has no knowledge of me giving this talk right now, I would like to just underscore that by reading a small thing. I, I apologize for reading from a, from a screen, but it's just too good just to not say it. A team of reporters and editors here at The Guardian won the Pulitzer Prize for their meticulous months-long work bringing Snowden to scale. Yet Snowden's first confidant was a filmmaker, Laura Poitras, who documented her initial contact and subsequent collaboration with Snowden in Citizen Four, the third in a trilogy of feature documentaries on war and the security state. It is the weakest film of the three, despite its Oscar. <laughs> now, I don't need to go on to tell you what's going on there. Why do we tolerate this shit from these people? What arrogant British cunts. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, in addition to not telling us about the raids, let's talk about another reality. David Miranda, working with The Guardian, working with Glenn Greenwald. Who do you suppose paid David Miranda's legal bills knowing that fact? Anyone? from The Guardian, care to comment? Right, so in the beginning, it was potentially going to be The Guardian, but later when Glenn left, it wasn't The Guardian anymore. They left them to hang again and again. So think of this in this case, this case in which serious journalistic freedoms are at risk, where serious people are in extreme danger under terrorism laws and they are simply left out in the cold. And why is that? Because in capitalism, when competing, when we aren't actually cooperating together, we find in that political space the ability to get rid of our competition, literally with terrorism laws. Is that really what we want? I think what we want is a collaborative framework where we actually work well together. Now, I know what I've done here doesn't work for much more than retiring, but that's okay. <laughs> and I'll leave you with another story. Um, I suppose two stories, and one is Luke Harding. Luke Harding wrote a book about Snowden in a very exploitative, extremely negative way, and knows next to nothing about anything in the story. But an important detail is he came here to Berlin to try to pump me for information, to ask me questions about Hawaii, to ask me questions about other details. And one of the things he told me was that all of his computers were compromised to the point that his mouse was moving on his screen without him doing it. And then he dumbly asks, as if, I'm not even sure if it, if it was possible that he could really believe that he didn't know the answer to this. He said, do you suppose my computer is compromised when, when someone is editing the text and it removes critical parts of my story? <laughs> you might want to see a doctor about that, Luke. <laughs> right? And finally, the most insulting aspect, I would say, about The Guardian is what they did to Julian Assange upon him being in the Ecuadorian embassy. And I can't underscore this enough. There are plenty of problems with Julian. I can barely handle Australians. They're very difficult people culturally. <laughs> and then there's Julian. <laughs> but the Guardian, in all seriousness, sent him a basket with soap and socks. Well, leaving us to hang, literally where we could face life in prison or the death penalty for the things that we have published, where alleged sources of ours are in prison or under threat or needing political asylum. That is not a serious thing to do, and these are very serious topics indeed. So I think that it is important for us to consider also, if you were to watch the film Media Stan, you will see the edges of publication in the Western world, and you will see the collaboration of the New York Times editor, where they have phone calls with the CIA. This is a political decision. This is not an objectivity fact. This is a political negotiation under threat, under coercion, and then it is a lie to the public and to other journalists to say that that is a non-political thing, that there's no issue. And if the question is the law about sources and methods and about names, well, sure, let us say then, we would love to publish the names. We would love to publish the sources and methods, but we can't because it is illegal for us to do that. But we should, because that would help us to hold power to account. And so we should work actually to change those laws to better inform people in our democracies, to ensure that it is actually possible to hold CIA agents who commit war crimes for their crimes to account. 
It is absolutely a necessity to do that, and we must, as a free press, do that. And when we do not, we are collaborationists who are responsible for being a part of those crimes. And so it is David Lee, it is Luke Harding, it is other people along these lines, like Alan Rusbridger, who collaborate with them. For example, The Guardian holds ProPublica in a gag you may not know this, but ProPublica has access to the Snowden archive, but they are not allowed to publish things unless The Guardian will allow them. And The Guardian has decided that they will not allow things from the Snowden archive to be published. Things from about Afghanistan or Iraq, crimes, serious war crimes are documented in there. Crimes where civilians are killed, things that are absolutely political, and we will never see them because of the collaborationists at The Guardian who absolutely kowtow to the British political class and the hereditary power structures in the UK. And we should not tolerate that, and we should pressure them. Now that I've um, committed journalistic career suicide, I'd also just like to encourage you to encrypt your communications. And, uh, and, uh, also, um, I think it's important to fight sexism in journalism quite seriously, and uh, I hope we replace most of the male editors in journalistic rooms around the world with women who have better sense and are stronger and will stand up to these fucking fascists. Woo!